and of course there are different ways to do this, I would say that it's most fair to actually do this once and not apply the pre-processing for each, uh, for each uh, mini batch. So you should do it like offline before on the whole training set. Implementation issues. So uh, this cartoon of course illustrates it very well. So I think um, it's always good to try with a simpler problem. So if you build a network, you should start out by building a simpler network. And then ideally when you when let's say that this simple network doesn't really fit the data perfectly, it doesn't achieve very high, uh, so a very low training error, then you should try to add additional layers and see if you can get the training error down. Here it's, uh, we've also seen that for example with this, in, it was a point in the residual network paper that actually training just very deep networks uh, without any tricks will not give you a low training error. It's very hard for the for backpropagation to fit uh, the data when you have a very deep network. So you should start with a simple version. Or maybe actually I, I said this a little bit wrong. Um, uh, so this is actually more about how to define the problem such that it's a simpler problem. So you should think about maybe if here in this example they have two problems that they want to the network to solve, to predict, and then you should actually start with the problem that you think is the simplest and only try to teach, train the network to solve that problem. Yes. Also it's a good idea to understand uh, your loss function. So a lot of the time uh, we work on classification problems and they are defined in log probabilities, the, the cross entropy laws. So you should think about if in this example, for example, if you have 10 classes uh, and you have equal probability, then your loss for like just a random guess, a flat guess of 10% for each class would be minus the log, the natural log logarithm to 0.2 and that's 2.8. And if you want to uh, kind of uh, see that you do, you actually learn something, then your loss function should definitely be be smaller than 2.8 on average per example. Yes, and you should also check your loss function whether it actually does the right thing. For example, if you really give it zero input, a random input, would it then give an error which is close to this uh, 2.3? Um, yes. Um, yeah, so there's also the point about uh, when we use for numerical reasons we like to take the output of a linear layer and usually put that into our cross entropy function so that it doesn't apply uh, apply the, the, the softmax uh, to the probabilities because that can give you numerical issues when you want to take derivatives and so on. So you have to check what is the expected input to your loss function. Is it kind of logit, kind of this linear outputs, or is it probabilities? And that can differ between different functions. Um, if you have several loss functions, for example, if you have a log likelihood loss and then you have a regularization loss, then you should be, of course, be careful about these hyperparameters that, that determine the, the uh, kind of relative weighting between these. And usually you have to do uh, some kind of uh, grid search to find these. But you can also have different, uh, for example, when you train GANs, which, will, which I will talk about in the, in, the, in the video for next week, then we have different loss functions and here we actually can have a possibility to weight these in different ways and the success of training can de depend a lot on these results. Yes, also monitor uh, many performance metrics. I talked about the area under the curve before, so if you have uh, other loss functions, then it's a good idea to look at those also. So, so of course we optimize in, uh, the log likelihood loss. We could also have kind of, when we optimize that, we can also at the same time plus and plot this area under the curve or the accuracy and see how that behaves. If you have implemented any layers yourself, you should check whether they're doing what they're intended to do. Of course, there's a very 
much higher chance that there's something wrong in those than in the labels that you kind of get for free in in in, in the uh, country uh, functions and so on. Um, also, and of course, when we do auto diff, we get a lot for free. But it also means that there could be things we have done where we where we actually uh, have, for example, uh, uh, disconnected a part of the network from the rest so that we don't actually opt, uh, update a lot of the parameters. So you should use the built-in functions um, in, in TensorFlow, for example, to see what are the parameters that the network will actually uh, update uh, by calling a function to do that. Yes, increase the network size. This is something you should do once you have actually checked everything else and you see now, okay, I actually have a problem getting my training error down. It could be that's because my network is simply too small. It could also be that I started out too big, but hopefully if you follow the other advice, you will not do that. You probably start with a network with only like one or two hidden layers. and You see if you have a big uh, data where you expect uh, you can learn a, a big network, then you should start increasing the size of the network. Also dimensions, of course, very nice thing about, uh, about all these tensor calculations we perform in, in uh, deep learning is that we learn kind of matrix multiplications because we get an error message from the program if the dimensions are not uh, the same in the dimensions we sum over. But if we, uh, by some chance, actually use the same numbers for all the dimensions, then we can much easier make errors. So you should really try not to use the same numbers uh, in the diff for the different variables, because then you risk that you actually make an error that will not be noticed when you compile the program. So take numbers that are different. Yes. Um, Explore gradient checking. So you should also, uh, if you, maybe not very likely, but if you've implemented some part of gradients sent by hand, then you can actually use numerical methods, for example, to check that your backpropagation works correctly. Um, and you can see some links in the blog post. Okay, so the next issue is training uh, issues. Solve for a really small data set. Very few examples, for example, up to 20, and see that you uh, then can get down to, to very low error. Check how you initialize the weights. Uh, there are some very nice methods like uh, Xavier or He initialization, which uses just the, the central limit theorem to argue why we need to initialize in, in a specific way, and they these methods are implemented in all the frameworks. Play with hyperparameters, they could be very important. Um, and this is, of course, you can do a grid search or you can do Bayesian optimization if you're very thorough, but you can also do a little bit of trial and error and again, go back and see what worked for other people on similar problem. Also, if you have a problem with not fitting the data, then reduce any regularization you have. Give it time. I mean, you can see many times that the error actually kind of goes down very slowly and it kind of looks like it's plateauing and then it starts dropping because it now finds a very good solution. So you should not just stop after a very short time, unless you really have a lot of experience with how this training uh, behaves. Uh, in some of the methods like batch normalization or dropout, these uh, methods work different at train time and test time. And if you don't remember to change this thing, uh, then you will not get the full benefit of these methods. So you should really be aware when you look, when you, when you have kind of insert a batch normalization layer, how it's defined, what are the arguments you use for training and you use for testing. Then this is something about visualizing the training on the way. And here you can see, for example, a link to TensorBoard that we have also talked about. And there are also some kind of things that we should usually see, right? We should see that the weights should be approximately Gaussian distributed when we look, we kind of visualize a certain hidden unit. And if these uh, weights kind of fall, blow completely out of bounds, then there's something wrong. 
Also, it's a lot of, of course, deep learning is a lot of trial and error, so it might be, and you can also see that in papers, many times they say I used the Atom optimizer, and it could be that they actually tried first something else, and then it turned out that actually the Atom optimizer worked specifically well for this training data set. And there's a little bit of black art, but maybe the way to avoid black art is to try different things. Exploding and vanishing gradients, of course, something we also talked about, but there's Kind of a remedy for this is to have what we call gradient clipping. And exploding and vanishing gradients is something that is a little bit annoying that can happen after many iterations and suddenly the gradients blow up and you get another numbers. And this also means that sometimes you actually have to uh, 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 decrease your learning rate uh, after uh, after uh, uh, it actually looked like for many iterations that it worked really well. You have to start over and then run with a smaller learning rate and then you can avoid this kind of problem. Yes. Also, if things go too slow, it might be a sign that you should increase the learning rate. But I'm, in my experience, maybe it's a personal thing, then it's more a problem that I run with a too large learning rate. Okay, not a numbers. Something that has happened to everyone who has tried uh, playing with neural networks. Um, it can become, it's because of vanishing, uh, no sorry, exploding gradients that you hit somewhere where the gradient, you take a small step and then suddenly the gradient is very large and then the next update you go nowhere where we have not a number uh, of your weight in your weights. It could also be that you uh, divide by zero or you take the natural log logarithm of zero and uh, these things, and this is something that to some degree can be avoided by the proper uh, uh, parameterization of the network. For example, I talked about that we should have this kind of logit formulation of the, of the cross entropy laws. Yeah, and here's also another article about other numbers. Yes, so that was it for 